Now, the general, overall topic is going to be the general theme of salvation. Salvation. I think one of the most common and frequently used words among Christians is either the verb save, the noun salvation, or the title Savior. Very common. Is she saved? Has he ever been saved? Common word. But not many people understand what salvation is all about. It's in the Christian vocabulary, but much misunderstood. What is it? Suppose you were handed a piece of paper to write down there, what does the Bible tell you salvation is? How do I get it? Could I lose it once I have it? The Doctrine of Salvation. In 1927, I was presented with my first Bible. And the person who led me to Christ, when I showed no appreciation for the gift, said, once you get to know the author of the book, you will appreciate its message. And she was right. It is only as we get to know the God of salvation, and only God can save. No one can contribute anything to salvation. Only God can save. You have to get to know the author before you get to know this great doctrine in his book. I want to give you one verse by way of introduction. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man... The unsaved man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you are here unsaved, you may have heard the word salvation. You certainly have sung about the Savior. You certainly have heard the word saved, but without knowing the author, you do not know anything about the Bi what the Bible teaches concerning the doctrine of salvation. Now, this great doctrine is linked with many other key words. Many years ago, the late Dr. H. A. Ironside wrote a little book. In those days, it was a Moody Call Portage book you could buy it for 29 cents. It's six dollars now. I bought a copy for 29 cents many years ago. The title of the book is Key Words of the Gospel. Recently, Warren Wiersbe, having read Dr. Ironside's book, he wrote a similar book, but he called his Great Words of Salvation. And I like Brother Wiersbe's title. However, Dr. Ironside's book has all the meat that others have. I'm going to give you some of these key words of salvation. They are essential to our understanding of the doctrine of salvation. We're going to begin with the word election. You can't disassociate the word election from salvation. If you don't know the doctrine of election, you don't know the doctrine of salvation. That's only one of many key words. Then there is the word propitiation. Do you understand what propitiation is? That is linked inseparably with the doctrine of salvation. If I don't know the meaning of that term, at least I don't understand the biblical doctrine of salvation. Then there is the word regeneration. That's a great word related to salvation. The word justification, a key word related to the doctrine of salvation. The word sanctification, if you don't know the meaning of that word, you don't understand the doctrine of salvation. Predestination, inseparably linked with the overall subject of salvation. Now, in a Bible college classroom or in a seminary classroom, there would be the best part of a semester given to what would be called soteriology. The doctrine of salvation it comes from the Greek word soteria, which means salvation. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. 
and it would take the best part of a semester to study salvation because all of these key words are inseparably linked with the doctrine. Soteriology. Well, we have a course in Christology, the doctrine of Christ. Or pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Or ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Or eschatology, the doctrine of future things. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. What does the word mean? Well, the word means literally to rescue, to deliver, to salvage. The Latin word is salvus, S-A-L-V-U-S, which means to salvage, to rescue, to deliver. It could be the saving of a ship and its cargo from sinking. To rescue, to deliver, to salvage something. Could be a burning house. The fireman may conclude there's no chance to salvage anything. We can't save anything. The best thing is to let it burn to the ground. The meaning of the word is simply to rescue, to deliver, to save. I want to show you how it is used, and then we'll move on from there. Go back to the book of Exodus, please, and turn to chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. The children of Israel have been in bondage in Egypt. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. God is going to rescue you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to save you from a situation. Now look across the page to verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day. That's just a little clue as to the meaning of the word salvation. To rescue, to deliver, to salvage, to save Now, you have another verse in the New Testament. By the way, same chapter, same verse, but a different book. Exodus 14.30, Matthew 14.30. In Matthew 14 and verse 30, Peter was walking on the water at the suggestion of the Lord. And taking his eyes off the Lord, being troubled by the boisterous sea and the winds, he cried out what is reportedly the shortest prayer in the Bible. Three words. Lord, save me. Rescue me. Deliver me. I'm perishing. Now, when we come to the doctrine of salvation, we are not speaking about salvaging a nation from destruction or a ship from sinking or a house from burning. We're talking about spiritual deliverance. Salvation from sin, to be rescued, to be delivered before it is eternally too late. Now, with that bit of background, we're considering the spiritual and eternal deliverance from the guilt and penalty of sin. Now, to us Christians, salvation is progressive. With us, it has a starting point. With me, the starting point was December 25th, 1927. On that day, I was saved. I was delivered. I was rescued from the guilt and penalty of my sins. All of them. That was only the commencement. But my salvation experience has been progressive. It had a commencement and it continues. Through the years, God has been teaching me how to be saved from the practice of sins. And I will never reach that state of perfection in this life. But one day my salvation will be consummated when I shall be saved, rescued, delivered from the possibility of sin. I'll never be tempted again. Salvation, from the human viewpoint of us Christians, 
It is a progressive experience. But viewed by God, it's a completed work. And it was completed before ever you and I were born. Before the foundation of the world, your salvation and mine was planned, perpetuated, and will be finally complete. God had it all worked out. For me, it's a progressive experience. But with God, it's a completed work before ever the world was created. Now we're going to begin with one of these key words. And I've chosen to begin with election. Turn, please, to Ephesians 1.4. Before we look into this first key word related to salvation, which perhaps is one of the most difficult and one of the most misunderstood words relating to salvation, is election. So much confusion. As a matter of fact, Christendom is divided into two main bodies over this one word, election. Very controversial, much misunderstood. I want to give you four guidelines for the study of election. Number one, the Bible does not provide answers to all of our intellectual and theological curiosities. There are some things that God knows that he does not put in the Bible. Therefore, inasmuch as the Bible does not explain all of these curiosities, there are issues involved that your mind or mine will never comprehend. But you put that down as guideline number one. And any attempt to reason or speculate beyond what God has written is useless. I'm not saying we should not think. God gave us a mind, an intellect to be used. But I never reason or speculate beyond the revelation of God's Word. God knows more than I do. Guideline number one, the Bible does not provide all of the answers to our intellectual and theological curiosities. Guideline number two, God is completely holy and righteous in everything that he does. Whether you understand him or not, whether I understand him or not. God is completely, perfectly holy and always right in anything that he does. I cannot always understand that, but that's a basic guideline. Now, if I don't know God, I'm going to be bogged down with the doctrine. But knowing that God has not revealed everything in his word, that he is infinite in knowledge and has not told me all, I made up my mind that whether I understand him or not, I rest in his complete holiness and his righteousness. Let me present one simple illustration, and I want you to look at some scripture. In the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, God took Abraham into his confidence And he said, I am going to destroy two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, that boggled the mind of Abraham because Abraham had some kinfolk living there. And he knew that the reason for which God was going to destroy those cities, his kinfolk were not guilty of. That's homosexuality and lesbianism. That was the breeding place in those days of that wicked sin. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to destroy those cities. It staggered Abraham. He's got kinfolk there. They're not homosexuals. And Abraham begins to pray one of the great intercessory prayers of the Old Testament. He's pleading with God. Lord, if there are 50 righteous people, 40, 30, 20, 10, will you destroy the city? And in the midst of that intercessory prayer, 
God revealed the great truth. It's tucked away in Genesis 18.25. It's a rhetorical question, a question where the answer is already understood and assumed. Here it is. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And when Abraham got to know God, that God always does right, God is completely and perfectly holy, it put his mind at rest. He couldn't understand why God would destroy cities where there would be innocent people living. But he knew that God was holy and God was right. It put his mind at rest. Oh, beloved, to get to know the God of the Bible is the secret. Much of the quarrels, the misunderstanding would be quelled if only we trusted the God of the Bible. Guideline number two, God is completely holy and righteous in all that he does, whether you and I understand it or not. Now, there are a scripture, too, that I think we ought to look at. Turn with me to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Verse 17. The Lord is righteous in how many of his ways, class? All his ways. And holy in how many of his works? Never forget that text. When you're wondering why you can't grasp some things that the Bible states, remember, God is righteous in all his ways and holy in everything that he does. Get to know the author. You'll have... No problems. Isaiah chapter 55. A familiar verse, but one I think we should apply to the subject. Isaiah 55 and uh, verse 8. Here's another familiar text memorized by many Christians. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's completely holy and righteous in everything that he does, whether you and I understand it or not. Trust the record. Just trust the Bible for what it says. You can count on it. It's going to relieve us from much misunderstanding. Guideline number three, the total extent of your knowledge and my knowledge is limited to that which God chooses to reveal. God knows more than what he put in the Bible. God is omniscient. He knows everything before it ever takes place. And to get to know God helps me to trust what I read in the Bible. There's another text I want you to get which will rule out human speculation and human reasoning when you come to the doctrine of election. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, please. Deuteronomy chapter 29. When you find the 29th chapter... You will find the verse with the same number in it. The last verse in Deuteronomy 29 is verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There are secret things that God has not revealed. Therefore, I am not going to rationalize nor speculate on something that God has not discussed. We do too much of that, and that divides God's children. Guideline number four. A work which is dependent upon God's grace 
cannot involve in any way any work of man. Grace and works can never be combined to establish a reason for anything God does. May I repeat that? Grace and human works can never be combined for the purpose of establishing a reason for anything God does. God does whatever he chooses to do, whenever he chooses to do it, wherever he chooses to do it, involving whomsoever he chooses to involve, and God is always right. I may not understand God's ways, and I don't always, but I will simply stay with the word. Now we're going to come to the doctrine of election. Please keep in mind the guidelines, completely. Now before we look at this word election, it is not predestination. The etymology of the words is different. They're not the same. Election is not predestination. Predestination is not election. They're related. They are both key words related to the doctrine of salvation, but they are not the same. You can never put them together. They don't mean the same thing. We're not studying predestination. We will do that later, God willing. Now, the words elect and election in both the Old Testament and the New can be equally translated choose, select, pick out. To say that God elects is to simply say that God makes a choice. He chooses something. It could be something inanimate, like a rock. He chose a rock from which came water for the children of Israel to drink. God made a choice. Sometimes he chooses people, picks out people, selects people. That's election. The word elect means to select, to choose, to pick out. So that election definition. Election is the sovereign act of God whereby he chooses, selects, or picks out certain parts of his creation. It could be an inanimate thing, or it could be a human being, always for a specific purpose. What is election? It's the sovereign act of God, whereby God chooses, selects, picks out something or someone, always for a definite purpose. God never makes a bad choice. And every time God makes a choice, it's to fulfill a purpose. Now, the fact that God makes choices and has the right to do so are inherent in his sovereignty as the creator. The sovereignty of God. He created and controls his universe. He has a right to make any choice he wants to make. If God chooses to use a thing or a person... For his purpose, it has to be right. God chose a donkey to speak in a language that a man could understand. That's not to boggle the mind of anyone. King James Version called it an ass. God made a choice, but with a purpose. I'll never remember of him repeating that. Don't I remember of a, a donkey speaking. Now consider just a moment, apart from God's choices, most of life's events would be matters of blind chance. We'd be up a blind alley, a one-way street. If God never made a choice, what would you know about the future? When I went to college, we had a course in philosophy, 
And we were assigned a textbook, The Philosophies Men Live By. And the book had ten chapters, and it was a condensation of the chapter, uh, each chapter a condensation of the main thought of ten philosophers. It began with Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Spinoza, came right down to modern philosophers. We had to read the book and then write a paper on what we got from that book. And as I read through the ten chapters of ten philosophers, I could see that they were all troubled about three things. Number one, origin. There were no telescopes in the days of the ancient philosophers. They were called armchair philosophers. No instruments, as we have today. They would sit down to think through, reason through the mysteries of life. In the evenings, they would sit and gaze out into God's vast expanse, the starry universe. And their first problem is origin. How did it get here? Then they would reason through the second major problem. What is the reason for it? The seasons come and go. People live and die. Purpose. And the third great issue that troubled the philosophers was destiny. How will it all end up? Now, they were right in what they were seeking for, but they didn't turn to the Scriptures. They could have found answers. Now, you can imagine, we don't know where we came from. We don't know why we're here, and we don't know where we're going. Tough situation. That's a tough situation. Thank God he made choices. I'm not walking up a blind alley, my friend. I know where I came from, I know why I'm here, and I know where I'm going, only because God made some choices. And without them, I would be saying, how will it all end up? I'm going to ask you to turn now to Psalm 106. Psalm 106, and I want to read a couple of verses, beginning with verse 21. Psalm 106 and verse 21. The psalmist writing some history concerning Israel, Israel said, They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works, in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen, his elect. That word chosen means elect. God selected, God picked out, God elected, God chose Moses. Classic, simple illustration of God making a choice. Somebody says, why did he cho choose Moses? It's none of your business, none of mine. If I know God, I won't ask a question like that. God is totally holy and right in his choices. God made a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham, the first Hebrew mentioned in history. And there are people today, why did God choose Abraham? You don't ask questions like that if you know the God of the Bible. God is pro-choice. God makes choices. And they're always right because He is holy and completely and perfectly right. One more illustration from the Old Testament. Turn, please, to Psalm 89, verse 34. He said, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. Why did God allow David to go through 
the peak of a career, a man who went to bed with a woman who was not his wife and impregnated her and deliberately arranged for the death of her husband so that he might appear innocent. Why did God pick David? I don't speculate. I don't reason. I only know that God makes choices. And in his holiness and his righteousness, God is always right. And if it boggles your mind as to why he chose Abraham, a pagan idolater, and David, a vile sinner, better sit down quietly and ask yourself, why did he ever choose me? God makes choices, totally by his grace, associated in no way with human works or human effort. Now, God makes the covenant, and God cannot break the covenant. Let's turn to the New Testament now, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is writing a letter to a local church, and the lessons apply to all the body of Christ, members of Christ's true church. I'm reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, or the set-apart ones, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now stop. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3 applies to you and me. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Would you like to think that through? And ask yourself, how did God accomplish this? Here we are, happy Christians with eternal life. Millions in the outside world who know nothing about God or Christ. Many because they don't want to know, some because they have never heard. How did this all happen? Why are we here in this place today? Verse 4, according, and that word according tells us that you can't disassociate verse 4 from verse 3. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings, and none of us deserve them. They're all by grace. Human works had nothing to do with it. How did it all begin? It may surprise you to know how and when it all began. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us, elected us, selected us, picked us out. According as he has chosen us in Christ when? Before the foundation of the world. Is there anyone here who can tell me on what basis God chose us? Would you like to try? On what basis did God choose us before the foundation of the world? There is no basis other than his sovereign will, which was totally independent of our works. We were not there then, before the foundation of the world. In 1 Peter 1, 2, we read that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Let me ask you another question. 
What did God foreknow that would cause him to choose us? I don't know. The Bible doesn't answer that. I don't speculate. I don't reason. He knows everything. But what particularly does 1 Peter 1, 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. God knew everything. The scriptures don't tell us everything. And when they don't, I don't guess, I don't speculate. There's a lot I don't know about the Bible, but beloved, I'm going to believe what is in here. God makes choices. Why? Why does God make choices? Why did he pick Abraham? Why did he choose David? Why did he choose Jacob over Esau? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God is completely holy. God is always right. I will not speculate. I will not rationalize. I will not have my mind boggled, worn out with argumentation. I will simply take what is in the Word and accept it. Why does God make choices? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. What was my question? Why does God make choices? For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen, picked out, selected, elected the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, elected, selected, picked out. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why does God make choices? Verse 29, are you ready? That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and justification or sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Why does God make choices? That ultimately he, the eternal God and sustainer of creation, should be glorified. Why did he choose us before the foundation of the world? Ephesians 1, 4, that we should be holy, and that glorifies God. Why does God make choices? It's right there. Very simple. You don't have to be an eighth grade graduate to understand that. That God should be glorified. We are chosen. God had a purpose that we should be holy. Now, I don't have time to go into as much detail as I would like, but I would like to um, raise one issue here or make a statement. Election is the basis of our assurance of eternal salvation. It's the guarantee that no born-again person will ever go to hell. It's in your Bible. Why? Because God made a choice. And God's choices are based on the holiness and the righteousness of God. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I want to read beginning with verse 33. Romans chapter 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's chosen ones, the ones he selected and picked out. It is God that justifieth. 
Justification is the sovereign act of God whereby he declares righteous any and all who come to him through faith in Christ. Can God reverse that declaration? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's chosen ones? The elect. Those whom he has selected and picked out. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate from the love of God? Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? What? Read the list. God's elect. That election is the basis of the believer's security. Now, there are some distinguishing marks of the elect. I have one final question. I know what's in your mind. I know what's in your mind. Maybe I will not frame the question in your words, but I can tell you what's in the mind of almost everyone here. How will I know that the person to whom I am witnessing is one of the elect. Come on now, let's be honest. I know that's the question in most of your minds. How will I know that the person to whom I am witnessing is one of God's elect? You see, dear friends, not only is God pro-choice, but you and I are pro-choice. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And when Adam sinned, the three basic essentials of personality were not taken from him. Intellect, the use of the mind. Emotion, the exercise of the heart. And the will, volition, the exercise of the will. God made you and me pro-choice. John 3.18 He that believeth on the Son of God is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's your pro-choice. God never took from you and me the capability of choosing. God said, now make a choice. How will I know that the person to whom I am witnessing is one of the elect? I may never know, and I may know, but I can be sure of this. The only way I can know is their response to the Word of God. Do you have a better answer? God said, you're pro-choice. Make a choice. We are made in the likeness and image of God. In that respect, we lost the holiness when Adam sinned. But we still are responsible for our choices. I want to say a word about this matter of choice. It is unfortunate that people make choices without considering the consequences of their choice. I'm not here to discuss the abortion issue. I want to say this to every pregnant woman. You already made your choice. You already made it. You're pro-choice. I'm pro-choice. It's the way God created us. I make a choice. And for all who receive the Lord Jesus Christ, they have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blame before Him. We thank Thee, loving Father, for the Holy Scriptures. There's so much that our finite minds cannot seem to grasp, to comprehend. But we thank Thee that there is sufficient here to occupy us to guide us, 
into a life of holiness that will please and glorify Thee. We thank Thee, Father, for the privilege of having heard the Word and for the work of grace through the power of the Holy Spirit that constrained us to accept thy truth. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.